bum 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 bum
And I know fandom gets a bad rap online because the internet is a hellscape, but when you go to these conventions, you don't see any of that toxic behavior. I've never had a bad encounter at a Star Wars celebration or a San Diego Comic-Con or a Baltimore Comic-Con or any of these conventions we've gone to. It's always been a celebratory event. You say that San Diego Comic-Con doesn't have like the same like deep pockets of a Star Wars convention or whatever. But like to me, the difference between a focused convention and a broader convention is like, a focused convention is like, okay, we're all going down the Marianas trench of this fandom. But like having the San Diego Comic-Con is like exploring the entire ocean. The Marianas Trench is there, but you just have to look for it. That's true. And what's beautiful about something like the San Diego Comic-Con are all the opportunities for discovery, Mm -hmm. right? We've discussed this event in our past episodes, but there was that Steven Universe panel that we stumbled into because we were just trying to get to the panel for The Good Place and we wanted to get there a little early. And suddenly we're watching the Steven Universe panel and we're becoming as emotional as those around us. You know, the love that they were giving to the panelists was seeping into us. Yeah, it, it, like, it's almost like you're on the outside looking in, but you are suddenly like, on the inside looking in, and you just get swept up in the emotion of the whole thing. It's kind of like uh, just kind of being a nerd for fandom in general. Like, I love being in the presence of someone losing their mind with love for a thing. Right, and if you attend a convention with that open heart, you will make new friends. Mm. You will find new comics, new movies, new books, new TV to devour and obsess over. And that's always the thing that I remember the most. It's I, I don't even really recall what is said in these panels as much as the energy of mm. those panels and then the people you meet next to you in those rows of seats. And we do seek out the the fandoms that we did not, exp- like, that we didn't go into Comic-Con, like, looking for. Like, I just mentioned earlier, Abbott Elementary. Abbott Elementary had a huge presence at yes. San Diego Comic-Con. Yes. And so we finally checked it out. That show is so great. <laughs> we love it so much. Yeah, we uh, sucked up those 10 episodes so quickly mm-hmm. once we hit play on it. But it took it took a Comic-Con to say, like, hey, uh, people are excited about this. Maybe you should be, too. Uh, new episodes on September 21st. Yeah. I'm Counting down the days. Can't wait. Uh, What I love about Matthew Clickstein's book, See You in San Diego, is it shows how that positive, addictive desire to celebrate comics, movies, books, whatever, was there at the beginning. The book goes back to the 60s and the 70s to this core group of friends who rallied around each other because of their love for all things geek and shows how there was this void that needed to be filled. And once this group started the process of creating Comic-Con, it just sort of swept away from them. I think we should be clear that what Matthew Clickstein has done with See You in San Diego is not like write a history report of this is the origin story of San Diego Comic-Con. No, not at all. What he's done is he has conducted a myriad of interviews from Brink Stevens, Neil Gaiman, Scott Ackerman, Kevin Smith. And then he has taken those interviews and like, like dissected them and resorted them into topics. It feels like he did the first layer of engagement with this primary source material that he's created. And then he's just like handing it over to us yeah, without an agenda, without any commentary. He's just like, and here's the quotes. Yeah. What's fascinating is the process in which Matthew put this thing together, because originally he produced a podcast mm-hmm. with these interviews for Sirius called Comic-Con Begins. And I highly recommend you go to the show notes, you click the link for that podcast and give that a listen to, because it is wonderful to actually hear these people's voices tell their story. 
But what CU in San Diego does is it takes those conversations and then it gives you the visual aid as well. Mm, yes. There are photos and flyers and pieces of art in see you in san diego that stuff I, that's never appeared anywhere else and it blew my mind there are some jack kirby homage pieces which we will talk about in this conversation that were i mean they were eye-opening <laughs> for sure and, and all you need to do is get your hands on this book flip through these pages it, fanographics has beautifully designed this text and like it it is if hmm, it's not a history text lisa is correct no but if you love comic books beyond just loving comic-con there are so many stories that tie to all your favorite comic books that are hidden within the fringes of these conversations. Stuff about Sandman I had never heard before from Neil Gaiman and how it originated at Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. There are just some real treasures here. I also think that See, See You in San Diego drives home the fact that everybody is having their own convention where um, through these quotes, each person is defining what San Diego Comic-Con is to them, and everybody's answer is different, and in lots of cases, straight up contradictory. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, there are moments, especially in the chapter on the future and the expansion of San Diego, where you do have people who are like, I liked it better when, you know? Mm -hmm. And and as, as somebody who has attended Comic-Con since 2011, post the MCU and the comic book movie explosion, we have no idea what Comic-Con was really like in the early 80s, right? And I'm sure it has just completely become something different and weird for those original attendees. But as we've argued on past episodes, there's no happier place on earth that we would rather be than San Diego Comic-Con as it exists today in 2022. I feel like this book drives home one of the like founding ideologies of comic book couples counseling. The idea that the experience you have is directly related to the narrative that you create. Yeah. So you do hear people saying like, oh, Comic-Con's gotten too big. It's gotten too commercial. But then you also hear people going like the, the bones of the original San Diego comic book convention is still there. You just have to know where to look. Yeah. Yeah, MCU is there, but also like whatever niche nerddom you have about Godzilla yeah. or 18th century corsets or whatever is there. You just have to explore. Yeah, and... That stuff was there in the beginning. It's mm -hmm. always been a pop culture convention. It was never purely a comic book no, convention. No, never, never. And we talk about that with Matthew Clickstein. So um, I know some listening are still thinking, well, this sounds like a Comic-Con wank fest. I've never been. No, thank you. I don't need to explore a see you in San Diego. Well, that's the first question we ask Matthew. You know, why should you, the person who does not care about Comic-Con, care about See You in San Diego? And I think he can convince you that you might want to take a peek at this book. So I think on that front, we should just get to the conversation. What do you say, Lisa? Sounds good to me. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us here at Comic Book Couples Counseling. Welcome to The Love Nest. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Lisa and I are die-hard Comic-Con attendees. That we are. We adore San Diego Comic-Con, but we've only been going since 2011. We have not missed a con since 2011, and we know that the con in 2011 is very different than what the con was when it started, and that's why we had so much fun with your book, See You at San Diego, getting into the origin story of this wonderful convention. But I guess we're... We actually wanted to start the conversation was even though we love Comic-Con, why do you think other people who may have never attended Comic-Con or don't even really understand what Comic-Con is would be interested in a deep dive that you have provided? That's a good question. And uh, certainly one that I've been struggling with throughout this whole entire process. Uh, 
Uh, part of it is that the book is much more uh, than about Comic-Con. It's much more than about San Diego Comic-Con. It's much more than just about the, the convention scene, really. In fact, it goes all the way back uh, to the 1930s, uh, well before Comic-Con even started. Uh, there's even a lot of references and uh, mentions made of uh, Frankenstein going all the way back to 1818 and H.G. Wells, early days of radio, the early zine scenes uh, uh, with science fiction folks and letters to the editor and that kind of thing. So really what the book is, uh, similar to the audio doc series Comic-Con Begins, on which it's an expansion, uh, is it's tracking modern fandom. It's tracking geek culture itself over the last century, I'd say, for the most part. But uh, to give it something of a narrative thrust, we did focus on the prehistory, history and expansion of what is the largest pop culture gathering worldwide, Comic-Con. So um, I think that anybody who's just interested in any kind of geek culture or what we now would just call pop culture references, uh, you know, would be into a book like this, whether you're into Star Wars or Star Trek, Rick and Morty, Twilight, Ray Bradbury, Flash Gordon, Superman, uh, really just about anything, Lost in Space, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Lord of the Rings. Uh, if you are if you are a fan, you're going to really love this book and the people talking about it who come from many different fandom worlds and intersected every year at Comic-Con. And you present it as an oral history. So you're literally giving like clippity quotes from a number of different interviews and I love the presentation of it, how you presented it, like in like this file folder of like, this is what I have collected and digested and now delivering to you. Can you speak to um, why you choose to um, use the oral history format? Yeah, and I just want to say real quick that the design um, really is due to Jonathan Barley. Mm -hmm. uh, he's our genius designer on the book that our publisher, Fanographics, thankfully brought on. Jonathan's a great guy, and I worked very closely with him on the ideas for the design, but it was really his concept overall, and he did the grunt work on making it look the way it did. And the book just wouldn't be the same without Jonathan's fine, fine design throughout. Uh, so I do want to name check uh, Jonathan Barley there. But uh, as far as the oral history is, is concerned, A, I love oral histories. I've always been a big fan of people like Studs Terkel, big fan of Please Kill Me, the punk oral history. Uh, the work of people like James Andrew Miller, who did the fantastic Saturday Night Live oral history in a recent HBO one. He's done ones on ESPN, CAA, and so forth. So I personally, I love reading uh, oral histories. Um, and I, you know, I've worked in the oral history format before and found it to be a very rewarding uh, structure to use. I did the oral history of Nickelodeon some years back for Penguin Slimed. Um, I've done some uh, shorter form oral history projects for different outlets and the like. And for me, it's a way of bringing in so many different stories from so many different people while still having, again, that forward moving beginning, middle and end. Uh, you don't want it to be all over the place. So I don't want it to just be a series of interviews where people are talking about all different kinds of things. So for me, an oral history like this is the best combination of allowing so many different voices, so many different opinions, so many different memories, sometimes those that might even contradict each other uh, or refute each other uh, into the book at the same time, while also cutting it together very much like a talking head documentary so that it's not just a series of interviews, but rather it's cut together to tell the full story. Uh, so for me, that's a lot of what the fun of an oral history is, is you get all those, all those stories in there but there's still kind of one narrative, one track. And again, that's why we chose to focus a lot on the prehistory, history, and expansion of Comic-Con so that it's not a 10,000 page book about all of pop culture that mm -hmm. you know would have been 15 volumes or something. I freaking loved the Comic-Con Begins docu-series that you produced and directed. Uh, it, like I, I, I was, every episode was like, an, it, it took an age for them to come out because I was so desperate to get to the next chapter. Uh, but when I was listening to the podcast, there would be moments where you would hear about Scott Shaw presenting to Jack Kirby, this deranged tales underground comics cover that does kind of a, uh, like a porn parody uh, spoof of a Jack Kirby monster creation. And I remember going like, oh man, I'd really love to see what that deranged tales 
cover looks like <laughs> and now with the joy for. of this book oh my god i get to see it <laughs> oh yeah i and i and you're right that is in there um and we actually had to work pretty hard on making sure the resolution was correct because you know it was an old one of the things that's about it that's so great especially for people who are into this kind of scene it's not only is, is it a funny picture it's well drawn um and uh, you know it's a little bit irreverent in that way of course from what you said um, but uh, also the historical value of it is so yeah. fascinating as a time capsule because this was a, a young man, you know, a kid almost yeah. who was drawing this thing back in the the, the uh, early seventies. Um, and so, uh, you know, we really wanted to be able to show not only the, the art because it's funny or it's interesting or it's well done, but also look what this young person did back then. So we really wanted it to be as clear as possible. So we really had to work on that. And of course, I, I had to tell the designer and and, and uh, everyone else, we, we really need to make sure that's a full page. They really need to see it. Uh, so, it pops. Uh, yeah, exactly. It really, it really, yeah, it really pops. And, and, you know, there are a few other pictures here or there that I think uh, might surprise some people. It's not always family friendly. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the joy of a book like this. And as you said, I love the, the audio documentary, uh, Comic-Con Begins. It has its own unique values to it. You know, hearing archival stuff of people like Jack Kirby and Stanley and others talking at actual cons back in 1970 and 75. And, so, and the music is fantastic and so forth. But, you know, certainly what sets the book aside from that it, are the pictures and the art. And, you know, there's over 400 pictures and art many of which people have never seen before. Um, you know, a lot of it was just me being dogged about reaching out to people like Scott Shaw and many of the other people who were involved in the podcast series who knew that we were doing the book and wanted to help out. And, you know, they were all very, very helpful. You can see that the credits to the pictures and the art are coming from so many different places, even friends of mine and mm. folks over at Troma got us some great stuff of James Gunn and yeah. the guy who does the porn version of Spider-Man. And yeah. don't worry, there's no nudity there. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I really wanted to try to bring it from so many different places because that's a lot of what the book is about. And that's also a lot of what Comic-Con and geek culture is about, is bringing together all of these different voices and people and things. So I wanted the photos and the art to really showcase that. I mean, we really could have gotten pretty much all of it from two or three people or two or three archives. Um, there were a few archives like Clay Geerdes's and Alan Lights who got us the bulk of the photos. But I wanted to make sure that to keep it as diverse and eclectic as possible, old stuff, new stuff. Certainly, it would have been a lot easier to go to only two or three people. Um, but uh, I really want it to be as eclectic as possible. And um, I think that is something that definitely sets the book aside because just looking through it. And that goes to your, your question earlier, too, of you know, somebody who might not be that into Comic-Con. You know, just pick the book up and look at it. I mean, yeah. just the pictures are fascinating. The people who are in there, and I really mixed up people who you might recognize versus people who you might not. So it's not like a bunch of celebrities all at once. Like they kind of pop up like they would at a Comic-Con. Um, and the art, some of it is just gorgeous. I mean, it's stunning. And, you know, including some of my favorite is John Pound, the first mm -hmm. artist to work on Garbage Pail Kids that uh, his friend Art Spiegelman created. You have not only the Garbage Pail Kids sketches that he did, but some of the notes and editor's notes. I mean, there's all different kinds of fun stuff in there. We really want it to be visually explosive. I mean, I was working with Fanographics, so I knew that the bar mm -hmm. would need to be set high. Um, and, you know, that's what we did. The period of time in which... San Diego Comic-Con bubbled into creation is such a fascinating moment in comics because you have the fandom around, you know, Jack Kirby and, and, you know, Jack Kirby himself is such a huge figure in this book. This book in a lot of ways is a celebration of Jack Kirby as much as anybody else. But then you have these kids who love Jack Kirby, but they also loved this underground comic scene. And so you have like crumb and you know uh uh oh dicaprio's dad george dicaprio yep yeah george dicaprio and, which and yeah, all, surprised a lot of people but yeah the leader yeah, and, DiCaprio's, uh, dad yeah exactly and all these people coming together to birth what would ultimately become this absurd pop culture event that we have every year that lisa and i attend um can you talk a little bit about the importance of that era that birthed Comic-Con and what you took uh, out of your experience of exploring it and analyzing it. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny uh, you say that. I was just having a discussion with one of the people at Fantagraphics just before this, actually, uh, about wanting to get a copy of the book to Aileen and Robert in France, mm. uh, because I really think that they should get a copy of it. Um, I actually have a mutual friend who's friendly with Aileen, stays with the crumbs when he goes to France, a lucky guy. Um, and uh, he, he mentioned it to her, sent her some pictures of some of the, the, the pages that have pictures, because... Uh, you know, even though Aileen and Robert never even went to Comic-Con ever, and, you know, from what I understand, are not particular fans of it, uh, <laughs> there's still, as you say, a lot about uh, Robert in there and Aileen and, and a lot of that scene, all the Zap Comics guys and gals and all the weirdo people and, you know, the San Francisco scene. Yeah, a lot, again, a lot of stuff that doesn't really have anything to do with Comic-Con per se, but is certainly part of that scene and that community, which is why I'm hoping we can get a copy to Robert and Aileen, because um, even though, you know, they're not Comic-Con people, they are such a big part of that world and of that scene and, and once again i can't say it enough there's some great pictures in there of them even just yeah. robert playing with the cheap suit serenaders his band that he used to play with and um you know at, at pizza places doing signings with terry zweigoff the, the you know the director of his great documentary and that kind of thing so um you know and that's that's why i'm literally trying to get the publisher to send one to him because i think he and aileen and that entire scene is such such a big part of the community of the geek culture community, because they were doing so much of what a lot of the guys and gals down in San Diego or even Los Angeles or anywhere else around the country, if they were lucky enough to know about what was going on with zap um, and what Chrome was doing and some of the other guys were doing, you know, that suddenly they realized, Oh, we can do our own comics. We can do our own work like this. And it inspired so many other people who would go on to do a lot of their own work. And, or collaborating with or being inspired by people like some of the boys that were doing what they were doing in Austin, Gilbert Shelton and Frank Stack with, uh, you know, The New Adventures of Jesus, which is considered possibly the first underground comic. Um, and just so much of what was going on was inspiring to the entire scene because it wasn't just the artwork and it wasn't just um, how beautiful it all was. And it wasn't just the irreverence of it and, and that kind of thing, just the, the content. It goes back to what we were just saying about Scott Shaw's, um, you know, artwork, where it wasn't just about the content. It was about what it meant. And it was about this idea that we can do it ourselves, that, that you know, we might be fans of Jack Kirby. We might be fans of, of you know, uh, some of the others that, you know, really helped to create, like, the, the bigger parts of the scene, the Superman boys and everybody else. But we we don't have to just work with Marvel and DC. We can do it ourselves. We can work underground. We can get these, you know, mimeographs machines or whatever, and just make it happen. And um, that inspired a lot of the people in San Diego who they themselves were kids. And yeah, they really liked the content of the crumb works and, and the zap stuff, but they also said, Hey, if they can do it, we can do it. And PS, not only can we make our own comics and, and, you know, our own little booklets and, and try to make, you know, short films and that kind of thing. But you know what? I think we can make our own comic convention, even though we're a bunch of teenagers. These were people who were inspired by folks who were their age or only a little older who were doing things like creating an entire underground comic scene, you know, just a few hundred miles north in San Francisco or making Woodstock happen or doing, you know, protests all over the country or all these things that were going on in the 60s and 70s that fed into geek culture and also the people who ultimately created Comic-Con. And they were all at the same time. Everyone was interconnected. Uh, the rock people, the comedy people, all different kinds of people who were of that age group, they were all reading, you know, Crumb and the Fabulous Free Freak Brothers and the rest yeah. of them. You know, they, that was one thing they all had in common. One of the things I love so much about going to Comic-Con is that it does, like, renew my creative well just from just going to a place and getting to see, oh, these people they, that I admire, they're right here and they're human beings and they're complaining about their hangovers or <laughs> they're yeah. talking about yeah. what they're fans of. And one of the, but one of the themes I saw recurring in your book that really um, engaged me was like the idea that like a, a lot of what you hear about Comic-Con is like, oh, it's not about, it's not about comics anymore or like, it's it's all about like the big names nowadays, but um, multiple people, including Lloyd Kaufman and Scott Ackerman and uh, Tim Seeley, they all talked about how the underground of Comic Con still endures. Like you just have to know how to find it. And um, are there other like misconceptions about Comic Con that you you wish more people who didn't attend Comic Con understood? 
Yeah, there's certainly the, the one really big one, which is another recurring theme throughout the entire book, as well as the audio documentary series. And one that I've been dealing with, frankly, on a marketing level and a lot of these interviews, um, uh, you guys even kind of brought it up a little earlier, uh, you know, goes back to why would someone be interested in something about Comic-Con? I mean, one thing that I keep getting over and over again is, oh, Matt, that book sounds great, but I'm not really that into comics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have to keep saying uh, that, you know, it's not just about comics. It's not just about comics. Just as the book's not just about Comic-Con, Comic-Con itself is not just about comics or so-called comics culture. And that's something that I certainly have been dealing with through this entire process. But also I know a lot of the Comic-Con people have over the years as well for that same very reason, which is that they're celebrating all of pop culture. They're celebrating all of geek culture. And, there and are it's been that people, way since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes, It's been that way since the beginning. That That's the important part. There are those people who say, oh, Comic-Con's not uh, just about comics anymore. It never was just about comics, ever. There was a special section just for Star Trek as early as 1973. Frank Capra was there in those early days. What does he have to do with comics? Nothing. They had martial arts people. They had magicians. They had people doing yo-yoing. Of course, a big, big part of the scene was the science fiction folks. I mean, you know, along with Jack Kirby and people like Forey Ackerman, one of the other, you know, huge people who were always there every year until he passed was Ray Bradbury. I mean, mm. you know, he had some of his books were adapted into comics, but you wouldn't necessarily think of him as a comics guy. Uh, you know, he's he's science fiction and film and that kind of or animation people, people like June Ferre and people like Bob Clampett and people like Chuck Jones, big, big parts of, of the comic con scene. You know, their animation, Mel, Mel Blanc, of course. So I think that is uh, a misconception that, I, you know, I know a lot of people have been trying to uh, rectify. And, I'm, and we certainly try to do that in the book, as we did with the audio documentary series, because that's what makes Comic-Con so great, is it's not just about comics. And it's not just about science fiction. And it's not just about Twilight Zone. And it's not just about Twilight. And it's not just about Star Wars or Star Trek. It's about all of it, all of them. If you have a fandom that you're into you will probably find some kind of representation there at Comic-Con, especially now. And yes, it's very expensive to go now and it's very crowded and it's, you know, huge with all these people. But because of that, you will be able to find some little corner somewhere, someone with a table or someone with, you know, 10 people in a room who are, as Barry Alfonso says in the book, doing a read around of Little Lulu recently. That happened at a recent Comic-Con. So yeah, you have Hall H and Tom Cruise and everything else, but you also have a group of people who are doing a read around of Little Lulu Amazing. at Comic Con still to this day. Yes. The the thing that I'm sick of being asked about, like when I tell people I'm going to San Diego Comic Con, it is, are you going to wear a costume? And are you going to resell your comics for gobs and gobs of money? And I'm like, no, I'm actually going to celebrate the storytellers. Like I love uh, the story that Mark Evigny told about. Uh, John Broom. I like the the idea of someone who works alone in a room, crouched over a table, getting applause for the first time in their career with and and realizing that they have they have fans. Yeah, you know, uh, Evanier is definitely one of the people that I was very excited to get into the the audio doc series in the book. Um, you know, he he's one of the foremost scholars of this entire scene. Um, and, uh, you know, I was a little intimidated. I mean, you know, he, he's the kind of person who would do a book like this and has done a lot of writings. Yeah. About this kind of thing. So he, he certainly knows. Um, and a lot of what he talks about in the audio doc series and certainly in the book is, and a lot of people talk about this too, like Stan Sakai is another one about how Comic-Con, yeah, you're right, it celebrates those people, including the people who deserve that celebration, maybe haven't gotten it before. And, and sometimes that even led to things like they're finally getting paid for the work that they did. I mean, even to this day, we watch it just happen with Batgirl. Um, you know, a lot of people who are involved in the comics industry or the pop culture industry in general to this day, uh, you know, don't often get the credit or the money they deserve or they're screwed over somehow by the large corporate interests that are involved. And, you know, Evan Ear and Stan Sakai and a few others talk about how that's another aspect of Comic-Con that's so important. And not just the Eisners or the Inkpot Awards, but just in general, how the fans who come there organize together and connect together and can make things like that happen, even going back to the early days when B. Joe Trimble and, you know, some of her friends helped to bring Star Trek back. You know, it was a little bit before Comic-Con, but they did do that as an organized group of 25,000 fans around the country. And it worked and it brought back Star Trek because of that Star Trek could go into syndication. And because of that, we're talking about it now. 
instead of some show that we wouldn't be talking about, like, I don't know, Time Tunnel or something like this. So that's a lot of what Comic-Con and the scene, again, revolving around Comic-Con is so important about, is bringing that sp that spotlight, those showcases to people like that. It's so, so much of the great work that Trina Robbins Another interviewee in our book yeah. and podcast series uh, does, you know, that's a lot of what she does now is as a her story. And as she puts it, she brings a lot of spotlight to particularly female comics creators and artists who maybe were ignored or who were screwed over by the system, so to speak, and is trying to help, you know, get them maybe paid finally or at least credit if they've passed and so forth. So that's a lot of what this is about, too, for sure. That's a lot of what the book's about. It's very important for me. Also, I really believe in that. Yeah, and this idea that uh, storytelling is a conversation and a, a way for humans to connect and uh, rejuvenate each other. And that, I think that's kind of like the brilliant theme that the RZA writes about in his afterword of your book. Like, how crazy is it that you've got the RZA writing it after oh, yeah. <laughs> for this book? Uh, but th that's what he it talks about is, you know, being an artist, there's a responsibility there. And it is, you know, you give something out into the world, someone takes it, and then it could become some other piece of art. I mean, you know, look, it, it's cliche and saccharine at this point to say, um, but storytelling has been with us since the beginning. Um, and even, you know, someone like Will Eisner and a few others would even suggest that comics have been there since the early days. I mean, he would refer to what he called sequential art. Uh, uh, you know, as as you know, some of the hieroglyphics and such back in the Egyptian days, and, and even before that, um, and just the idea of of telling stories by the fire or telling stories by uh, playing on the drums, uh, you know, for some of our early civilizations. I mean, it's about explaining what's happening. It's about explaining our world. It's about understanding our world. And whether it's looking up to that big ball of of light in the sky and wondering what it is, and talking about what it is, and exchanging that with with what it is, and eventually making stories about what it is and it's a demon or it's a god or it's a this or it's a that you know uh you know going all the way back to the beginning it's it is how we as a society developed and moved forward and let's be honest you know i know that there is you know some proof that certain other animals and so forth communicate with each other in very sophisticated ways but as far as we know there's just not a storytelling skill set that exists except for in our species of you know millions around the globe uh, that do what we do where we and, and at least put it down on paper and put it down you know on something that can be seen on a screen and can really be exchanged in the way that we do where you know someone who lives up at the most top of the planet could have a story that's told to somebody at the bottom of the planet or, or or vice versa so that is so much of what this is about again that goes back to why i wanted to do this as an oral history because for me one story is great but 50 stories are even better you know, and, and or coming from 50 different storytellers, even because then you've got, you know, 5000 stories. So um, that storytelling is certainly a big part of what this is all about. And whether there's text in it or there's not text in it, whether there's sound or there's not sound, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter as long as there is something being talked about that might connect with us and that might open our eyes to something new or that might shock us or make us uncomfortable and make us feel anything, laugh. You know, that's what it's all about. That's ultimately, I think, what a lot of geek culture and Comic-Con is about, is sh the sharing of all of that. Clearly, like, one of the skills you have honed is taking all of these uh, conversations, like, disparate conversations, and then bringing, like, um, meshing them together to create one big conversation. And I love how you feature this in the quotes that you chose at the beginning of the book. Because you start with this future shock quote about like the the toxicity of nostalgia and then like the Christopher Miller quote from American Cornball about like how pop culture is sometimes misconstrued as being about the majority. And then you end on the Birdman quote, mm -hmm. a thing is a thing, not what is said about that thing. And I love that you... So I have the way that I'm interpreting your use of that quote. Um, but but can you can you talk a little bit about why you ch you chose that quote in particular and, and what you think it says about your book? Wow. First of all, I've I've done many books. Some have gotten credited for some I haven't. I think this is book number 20 or 21 or something at this point. And I pretty much always, even in some of my long form articles, work very hard to find and use opening quotes. It's sometimes, honestly, one of my favorite parts of, of my projects. 
It's the things I'll often go back to and look at. It's almost a way for me to archive quotes that I think are just very important in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're always writing down quotes from books or movies that we see and that kind of thing. And I don't know about you guys, but really <laughs> Lisa does that. the same. I do. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the difference is for me, I'm lucky enough where I've been able to publish some of these books. And so I can kind of put them in there so I can find some of the really key ones that maybe meant a lot to me for whatever reason at that time. And I'm on, and what I'm going to say is of all the books I've done, of all the interviews I've ever done, this is the first time that anyone's ever noticed or even talked about the open quotes. Oh. So thank you very much for doing it first and foremost, because it really is of like, thank you for, you know, engaging with it like that. Cause it really is one of my favorite parts of every project. I sometimes will have the opening quotes to a project before I even know what the title is or start bringing it together. Like sometimes that's like, I can't wait for people to see these quotes and Oh yeah, they'll also be part of a book. Like the book is almost the distribution route for these quotes <laughs> that get out into the world, especially the quotes in this book. And you know what? Uh, even my, uh, it's funny, even my, uh, my uh, colleagues on Comic-Con begins, might remember this, but I actually tried to sneak in the Birdman quote into that at one point. <laughs> I was going to have to bring Stevens, um, our uh, our narrator of sorts, along with the other voices, uh, you know, read it off at one point. But we just we weren't able to get it in for time. Uh, obviously, I, I'm very guerrillas, as you can tell. Um, but the point is that I've tried to get it into other places too. It's a quote that I've wanted to use for years. I love that movie. First of all, I think it's one of the truly great masterpieces, certainly of the last you know two or three decades. It's a quote that's on my wall, uh, on a on a similar uh, you know note card, just like in Michael Keaton's dressing room in the movie. Um, and for me, you know, those other quotes are very important. I I really like the James Gunn quote from the mm -hmm. specials too. In fact, I've used that in other places also. But for me, that quote from Birdman, which might be attributable to Susan Sontag, um, might not be. I, I couldn't find that for certain, but um, for me, it's, it's almost a playful way of saying, you know, you're about to read 500 pages of over 50 people talking about something, but at the end of the day, a thing is a thing and not what is said about that thing. And, you know, for me, I, I think it's a little playful. I think it's a little bit of an ironic joke. It's, it's an interesting way to start an oral history is to basically say, you know, don't forget what people say about something isn't what it is. Mm -hmm. By the way, here's 500 pages of people saying what this is. <laughs> so I, I just, I thought it was kind of a fun little irreverent joke, very much in spirit with the people who created Comic-Con and the people of the scene. But I also think it's important for people to remember on a serious level that these are people and they're fallible and they have fallible memories and they also exaggerate especially a lot of these people and they argue with each other and especially something like comic-con of the early years of geek culture there weren't cameras really and there weren't it was one of the reasons it was so hard to get so many photos and art for this book people weren't running around with their cameras taking pictures of everything or their phones or video cameras or whatnot and these were a lot of young people who weren't really even thinking about posterity they were just doing it to do it which again goes back to the quote um so for me i think it's a little bit of a joke but it's also a little serious of don't forget that, you know, no matter what all these people say about this, this very eclectic, very protean thing of not just Comic-Con, but geek, geek culture, it just is what it is. You know, you can't ever fully explain what Comic-Con is or what any of geek culture is. And that was my point. And I'll just end that part by saying one of my favorite books of all time is Cassavetes on Cassavetes by mm. Greg Carney, where he interviewed John Cassavetes. And it's a huge book, six, 700 pages. A lot of filmmakers love it. I love it. And again, it is 600 pages of interviews with John Cassavetes. The last line of the book is, I don't want anyone to imitate me, mm -hmm. Cassavetes says. And, and that was obviously a choice that the author, Ray Carney, chose. And again, it's the same thing of, here's 600 pages of John Cassavetes telling you exactly what to do as a filmmaker. And the last line is, I don't want anyone to imitate me. So I just love that idea of here's all this information. Here's all these stories. Here's all these concepts. But don't forget, you know, like it, at the end of the day, you'll never fully understand it. At the end of the day, it just is what it is. And I just love that idea. And I love that I got to promote the movie Birdman because I think it's a masterpiece. Um, I, that, that is how I interpreted it. I'm giving myself a huge gold star. <laughs> um, uh, like I also think about like when you're talking about, uh, you know, a th the thing is th is a thing like a lot of these um interviews came from august 2020 to november 2020 
And that was a very specific time in history. Oh, and yes. like, if you had done, like, if you had done <laughs> this same conversation in 2019, a, a bunch of these conversations in 2019, or did, done a bunch of these conversations in 2030 or whatever, like it would be a different, it would be an entirely different book. Don't you think? Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, on one level, I, I don't want to make it sound like the book is going to be timely in any way or, or mm-hmm. just kind of faddish uh, in that regard where, you know, it might, it might fat, you know, F A D D I S H or, you know, or just kind of be of a certain time and that's it. You know, a lot of these people have been telling some of these same stories for years now um, or, you know, have, have talked about it elsewhere. Um, but I, I do agree that I think some of these stories and some of the opinions, some of the speculation by these people, these experts of the scene, the people who made it all happen, um, were probably impacted in part by the times. Um, and because it was such a uniquely crazy time, you know, and, and there are things that people might, you know, not be able to really know about Gene Henderson, for example, who I'm really glad we were able to get into the audio documentary in the book. And him talking about his wife, Mary, who had passed away years before, uh, he had told me early on that he wasn't going to be around by the time the podcast was done. And he was right. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that we were able to get him in time to get him on record. Um, So, you know, but at the same time, you have to remember, not only is he dealing with COVID and everything else, he knew that his clock was ticking. uh, Mm -hmm. And so much so that he ended up being correct. So that's going on while he's doing his interviews. Um, and, you know, a number of people that we talk to are losing family and friends and they're upset and freaking out about, uh, you know, some of the political stuff that was going on at the time and, and just what was happening with technology and the lockdown. So yeah, a lot of them were definitely very impacted by what was happening. We talked about it a lot. So there's probably a sense of that I will say though, and a few of them also said this to me, especially some of the folks who are, you know, a lot older and, and it was a lot more difficult for them even to get out of the house and that kind of thing. They said the doing the interviews and also just delving back into the nostalgia for all this stuff and going through some of their old diaries and some of their old books, booklets and program guides was a way, a few of them told me it was a way for them to escape all of that. And one of them, even Jim Cornelius, uh, who, was a, who was an artist during those days, still around, he drew me a picture and sent it to me. And not only was he going through all this stuff, but his wife passed away during all this. And it really was traumatic for him. And he sent me a picture and it was just this, you wouldn't, you know, it was this bright, beautiful, happy picture of thank you. I had so much fun doing the, the interview. And we, mm-hmm. we've talked about it since he's become a good friend. And for him and a lot of other people, I think being able to kind of lose themselves in this world from the past was a way for them to kind of get away from an escape all of the craziness of 2020. So yes, there was some semblance of that, I think, because they couldn't not, they're human beings. But also I think they were able to kind of be that much more separated from the time that we were in and really delve back into the 1960s and 70s and 80s because they kind of had to. It was an, it was a way for them to transport themselves away from all the craziness that was going on right then. So That's um, what I, th- yeah. I think is so special about yeah. like oral histories though, is like this idea that like, our memories are mutable and they're and they're precious and like when you get a slice of a memory from a specific time like that is a jewel like that is just so extraordinarily special yeah um you know the, talking about gene henderson uh is a good example or 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 some of the other people in the book who you know probably won't be around much longer, unfortunately. I mean, there are people that are really getting up there in age. And I know from talking with them and almost all of them, I've remained very friendly with or friendly with their kids and grandkids and talking about this. And and it's clear a few of them won't be around much longer. And I'm just really proud of the fact that we were able to get them on record and we were able to get them into the podcast series and now the book, pictures of them in there, some of which, you know, had never been seen before, but particularly a lot of these people like Gene and, and B. Joe and a few others who maybe people might not be as familiar with, but should be, especially B. Joe Trimble. I mean, if you're into Star Trek, you should know who yeah. B. Joe Trimble is. And if you don't, please go and look her up right now. Yeah, um, uh, we've interviewed her. <laughs> yeah, we've had her on the podcast. And so yeah, proud. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, of course, I'm saying that to the listeners more than more than you guys, but yeah, I'm not trying to, <laughs> not trying to be Mr. Oslotizer here. But, and, and I just, I love B. Joe too. She's so yeah. cool and she deserves a lot of, you know, a lot of the spotlight, her husband, John, as well. Um, so the point is that I'm very, very proud we were able to get these folks that kind of spotlight and legacy. And those of them who have plenty of it, people like Scott Shaw, people like Jim Valentino, obviously some of the really big names, the sort of special guests we got in there, Kevin Smith, Neil Gaiman, you know, 
particularly like a Kevin Smith, I don't really think they need our help. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it's great to get them in there as well. And certain things that they talked about, the Russo brothers, I think the way that they talked about what it was like to go to Hall H and to stand out there in front of thousands of people and say, hey, guess what? We're going to be the directors of the new Marvel movie. Um, you know, to get that in there as well, I think is really special and important and, and goes back to that idea of a time capsule. And, you know, there were people who asked like, oh, why, you know, why did you get those folks in there? And maybe it should have just been the Scott Shaw's and the B. Joe Trimble's and the early folks. And I said, you know, A, marketing wise, we definitely need some of those bigger names in there that helps to, to get the word out. Otherwise, we just have something kind of for ourselves. But B, more importantly, I do think on a storytelling level that, yeah, you want to hear about Scott Shaw talking about getting this underground comics thing to Jack Kirby when he was a kid um, or, you know, just those really early days of Comic-Con. But it is also kind of cool to get in there, too, for the full three-dimensional story. What is it like for the Russo brothers to go out on stage at Hall H, you know, just a few years ago and say, hey, thousands of people were about to do the new Marvel movie. What's that feel like? What's it sound like? You know, that's important too. Or Neil Gaiman, what's it like when he goes to Comic-Con now and has to have, you know, bodyguards all around him and has to be escorted here or there and might be doing a bunch of panels and all of a sudden has to go to the bathroom, which is a story he tells in the book. I mean, who so would have thought about that? Yeah. yeah, poor Neil Gaiman, you know, you see him on all these different panels and stuff. And at some point you have to realize, boy, I hope that guy's going to the bathroom, you know? And, and it turns out at one point he didn't and really had to go. And so, you know, stories like that, that, you know, I'm glad we're able to get in there too. And, and Neil Gaiman and Russo's and Kevin and Scott Ackerman, you know, they're not just in there. Yeah, it helps with the marketing, I'm not going to lie. But they're not just in there for that reason. You know, we didn't just pull Angeline Jolie or, or someone like that or a Tom Cruise or something, you know, just to get their names in there. And, you know, they talk about Comic-Con for five seconds and that's that. The people, the, even the celebrity folks we got, you know, Frank Miller, Lloyd Kaufman, um, you know, they're people who uh, have a lot to say about these topics. I mean, Scott Ackerman blew our mind. I mean, he's been going to Comic-Con since 1985. Like, yeah. And he was trying to collect old fan Fantastic Four comics. I mean, he's the real deal. His um, bit about uh, hotel reservations. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. real. Exactly. You know, like, and it is that idea, again, of even some of the celebrities, you know, have to deal with how hard it is to get a hotel at Comic-Con. And which is a great story, not only because... Um, you know, it, it gives that kind of intimate, what's it like to be someone like Scott Ackerman at Comic-Con, but also it, sh it is a good example of this is how crazy things have gotten, where even Scott Ackerman going with someone who's also a pretty big name person, Brian Posehn, that, you know, how they still struggle together to get a hotel room and how they'll share a hotel room because it's cheaper that way. I mean, that's, that's really crazy to think about, or the story Scott tells about Aziz Ansari trying to, you know, uh, get ahead of the line because people were bugging him because he's famous and, you know, the, the bouncer having to say no you have to wait in line like yeah that goes on at comic-con i mean that's that's a pretty <laughs> funny story that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise so i'm glad we got that stuff in there too and things like that that might surprise some people that uh, yes folks even in aziz and sorry has to wait in line at comic-con well matthew you've created an incredible document with cu in san diego and it's certainly something that feels written directly for brad and lisa but we do agree at the end of the day like this is a book about some really interesting characters at a very specific moment in time. And I think you could give this to anyone, whether they like comics or pop culture or not. Like I would love to give this book to my dad. Mm. I, I think my dad would eat this book up and he would find a character who we haven't even talked about shell Dorf, to be so fascinating. Uh, and, and all so many characters, like the story of bring Stevens and Dave Stevens and their relationship in this. There's just like every kind of story is hidden in the Comic-Con experience. Yeah, I appreciate your saying that. And, you know, th there's something to that, too. It's sort of like what I was saying about the pictures of the art. Even someone who thinks that they don't really care about Comic-Con or, 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 or comics at all or geek culture or what, you know, might consider pop culture, I think could still really enjoy the book. A, because, boy, I hope there are people out there who, even if they're not into something, they might still want to learn about it. Yeah. Or read about it. You know, it's like you don't have to read this book just because you're into Comic-Con. Maybe you're reading it because you want to learn about what this thing is called Comic-Con that people are all talking about and whatnot. So first of all, there's that. But second of all, I agree with you that there's just some really good stories in there. Look, I'm not a big sports fan. I don't watch so I don't watch sports and never really have. But there are definitely documentaries and books and biographies that I find fascinating and that I'm attracted to because I'm not a sports fan. So I might watch, for example, Winning Time, the the limited series about the LA Lakers, which and, is you know, great. 
like, yeah, which, you know, and again, and I'm, trust me, I'm well aware that it's not very historically accurate, but it's still very interesting. And there's obviously still a lot of history in it. It's well made. So it's just a good story. And I think there's a lot of really good stories in this book that even someone who might not know who Dave Stevens is or might not know who Brink Stevens is, the story of their courtship and breaking yeah. apart and how that Im- impacted each other's art and the, all the other crazy adventures they had and their friends like Richard Butner had with them through all that, I think it's just a, a dang good story. So if nothing else, you've got a ton, thousands of great stories in this book. And I think that's something that hopefully will connect with people beyond comics or geek culture or pop culture uh, or Comic-Con. So we'll have links in the show notes for everyone to find the book as well as Comic-Con Begins, the audio drama uh, or docuseries. Um <laughs> But for those folks that don't check out my show notes, uh, can you point them to where they can find you online and continue this conversation? Sure. Um, You can find everything and anything we're talking about uh, fully updated, um, mainly at my website. I mean, I have stuff all over the internet, all these different books and projects, and even, as you said, Comic-Con Begins and See You at San Diego, which is the book. Uh, I don't think we've said it once uh, since we've done this whole thing. Boy, Gary's going to kill me. Um, But um, yeah, See You at San Diego is the book. Um, but, uh, so you can just look that stuff up and find it, or you can go to my website, www.matthew, yes, with one T, M-A-T-H-E-W, Clickstein, that's K as in kangaroo, L-I, C as in cat, K as in kangaroo, S as in Stephen, T as in Thomas, E-I, N as a number.com. That's www.matthewclickstein.com. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll find everything you want there, including some of my other book projects from the past and, uh, clips of my work and everything and anything. And also, uh, there's also a list of our tour dates. I don't know when this is airing, but, uh, we're going to be doing a tour starting in Los Angeles and all along the way, we're going to have special guests. Um, we're doing, we're, we're, uh, we're going to be doing something with Trina Robbins at the San Francisco Cartoon Museum. Um, we're going to be doing CXC with Jeff Smith. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, a comic book shop in Toronto with Hoche Anderson, um, I'm, I'm going to be getting Barry Alfonso at a comic book shop in Pittsburgh. Uh, we're doing panels. We're doing all different kinds of, I'll be at colleges, museums all over the country, uh, from early November, uh, early September through November. You get all that information on my website as well. Uh, so definitely check that out. Most of the events are free. Some are ticketed, uh, but most of them are free. So if you know, and you'll probably be somewhere in your area, except the East coast, we weren't able to do that yet <laughs> in the spring because I would obviously love to go to New York and Baltimore and that kind of thing, but not yet. SPX. I'd love to get you. Yeah, SPX. Sorry, SPX would be great. That would be perfect. Um, you know, I think this is the kind of thing even that would, that would be at, at certain film festivals and whatnot, like Southwest, South by Southwest and, and Tribeca or something. I think that there's a connection there. Um, so we'll see, you know, but, but for now, early September through mid November, we're doing a bunch of different events. And, and for people who are in the LA area, that's going to be the big one. Uh, we're doing a book signing at Skylight Books, my favorite bookstore, the largest bookseller, uh, independent bookseller in LA. And then we're going right up the street to a movie theater that the American Cinematheque now runs uh, there in Los Feliz, where we're showing Scott Pilgrim versus the world, one of the great geek culture masterpieces. And then we're doing a panel right after, and it will have Scott Shaw and Paul M. Salmon and Wendy All and a number of other, the, the Comic-Con folks and people will be there with us virtually, like Jim Valentino and Maggie Thompson and uh, Floyd Norman, actually, oh. not the book or the audio doc series, but it's definitely part of the scene. We become friendly with him over the last year through a lot of the comic-con people so originally floyd was going to be there but um all of a sudden he said a a a very uh adamant mouse uh had to pull him away for something sure Um, sure (laughs) everyone has to follow mr mouse he actually used a different (laughs) phrase for it but i won't say it (laughs) um but uh anyone who knows floyd or knows of his work knows his uh interesting relationship with the mouse but um Point is, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll probably be doing like a phone call thing with him. And so it should be a really fun night, basically an, an evening with Comic-Con at a bookstore, movie theater, and then the panel. So that's happening September 8th in LA. More oh. information on my website. Yep. That said, hold on. September 8th? Yeah. That's D23 weekend. I'm going to be on the West Coast. Well, A, uh, you know, try to swing by and B, this, mm. this, that's connected to what we just said about Mr. Norman. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, Interesting. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. 
but yeah, I mean, so yeah, if you want to, my only caveat would be get your tickets now because it's, uh, you know, it's been on sale for a little while yet. So I, I don't even know if they sold out yet or what, mm-hmm. but you can definitely find that information on my website. Please let other folks know. Um, and I'm, I've been made aware that there will probably be some chances for some elbow rubbing uh, with some folks too in the audience. I understand that there's some folks coming that will not be on the panel, but uh, you might be excited to be sitting next to. So oh, very cool. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Matthew, this has been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting to you about your book. Uh, see you in San Diego. Uh, and we know we're huge fans of it. Uh, we are excited for our listeners to check out this book. And uh, we're we're now maybe possibly excited about going to see Scott Pilgrim versus the World with you. A very significant Comic Con movie. Yes, it had uh, quite the reception when that film came out, and then not such a great reception uh, with the rest of the world. <laughs> It's definitely it's a fun movie and we wanted to see it on the big screen. I I had talked with the American Cinema Tech people who I love. They're a great organization, um, and you know they're a nonprofit as well. I actually used to volunteer for them when I was in film school twenty years ago out there. Uh, so and I love doing events with them. Um, and they they now run that small theater there in Los Feliz that happens to be right up the street, like literally a block away from Skylight. So we just we're all going to just walk up there, like we're at an Andy Kaufman show or something like that. Um, and we actually might then walk back to Skylight to do the rest of the panel because we only have so long at the movie theater to do the panel. So we might be going back and forth between a, a really cool bookstore and a really cool movie theater, which I can't imagine something more Comic Con than that being uh, happening. But the point <laughs> is, um, uh, we talked about a lot of different geek culture movies. You know, two thousand one Space odyssey king kong um you know maybe even you know flash gordon or something like that uh but you know we, we also talked about maybe some newer ones like ghost world or i brought up scott pilgrim just to kind of you know bring in the kitties so to speak and uh they, they thought that might be a fun one and what i love about scott pilgrim just real quick and why i think it's so representative of all this is it does bring together everything i mean it is manga it is video games it is comics it is science fiction it is fantasy it's sitcoms it's animation it's it there, there's no it's rock and roll it's punk it's hip-hop it's electronic um, there's so much in it uh, from all different walks of not just geek culture but pop culture in general and in fact I'll say, uh, I know I'm a talker, but I'll say this is something I've been saying a lot recently too. I can't remember where I read this. I wish I could, but I'm going to, I'm going to take it and, and run with it. You know, it's not geek culture anymore and it's not pop culture anymore either. I think it's time. I think we need to all just come to terms with the fact that it's culture. This mm-hmm. is culture. We don't need to call it pop culture anymore. That doesn't mean anything anymore. It's culture. It's everything. Let's just be honest. There, there, it's all, it's movies, it's TV, it's animation, it's fine art, it's music. All of it has been impacted by this stuff. It it ha- it it has conquered. It's one. So yeah. let's just say it. It's not geek culture. It's not pop culture. It is the culture. Is this stuff that we're talking about and that we love? Amen. You know, and more more and more people say it in the in the podcast in the book. At the end of the day, the geeks won. I'll amen. say another amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, Matthew, thank you so much for chatting with us. You enjoy the rest of your evening. Will do. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> And there you have it, our conversation with Matthew Clickstee. And since then, you went to that screening and you had the best time <laughs> of your life. I have bought tickets to the Scott Pilgrim versus the World screening. I am going to land in L.A. at uh, around noon. That gives me plenty of time to get to the bookstore at six o'clock and do this thing. Now, will I be exhausted Possibly. You're going to have to tune in next week or just check the Twitter feed at CBCC Podcast or Instagram CBCC Podcast to see if I made it to the Scott Pilgrim versus the World screening for the CU in San Diego launch party. Regardless, on this, like, our little interview time with him was so fun. It really was. He is a great hang. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we talked for quite a bit after the recording. Uh, I, I always go like, why do I stop recording? I want to keep all of this. <laughs> Uh, but yes, yeah, so our, our thanks to Matthew Clickstein. See You in San Diego is currently available for Fanographics. It is in all bookstores, all comic book shops. Go take a look at it. Flip through this thing. Uh, look at that Jack Kirby homage, that underground flyer because it is a unless mighty you are, thing to behold. <laughs> unless you're easily scandalized. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not easily scandalized. And I had heard that portion of the Comic-Con Begins podcast. And then I saw uh, Scott's piece 
And I go, oh. And it I, poked you right in the eye. <laughs> it poked me right in the eye. And I started blushing. And then I immediately felt bad for Jack Kirby in that moment. <laughs> but yeah, so it's a treasure trove. This book is a treasure trove. You need to flip through it. So there you are. There you have it. Right now, uh, Brad is partying with Matthew Clickstein. No, I'm on a plane back, Lisa. Kevin Feige. <laughs> and, um, and I need reasons to look forward to the future because I'm alone, <laughs> not partying. There's so, so many reasons. So, yeah. So tell me, what do we have coming up on the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast? So we're our, we're, we are starting our next couples session. This is going to be uh, so cowabunga, dude. It is going to be cowabunga, dude. We are discussing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and their sibling romance. I'm so excited as an only child to explore the notion of sibling love. Yeah, well, the sibling romance makes it sound like gross. I, you, like, I love that, Game of Thrones. I haven't Lisa. seen the the Donatello <laughs> Mikey slash fiction, and I don't want to. I mean, if you prefer me to call it a bromance, we can call it a bromance. But sibling love, I've seen it between you and your siblings. It exists. It's a real thing. Yes, it is a real thing, but it, I wouldn't classify it as a romance. Okay, all right. I, did I say romance? You 100% did. I did say did. romance. Okay, yeah. okay. Romance doesn't work. All right, I'll give you that. We'll just go with sibling love. Yeah. Sibling love is a fraternity. real thing. Fraternity. Yeah, fraternity. But uh, non-gendered. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Lisa. Who is going to be our love expert to help us guide us through the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Our love expert is Don Hubner, Food, PhD, and the book is The Sibling Survival Guide, Surefire Ways to Solve Conflicts, Reduce Rivalry, and Have More Fun with Your Brothers and Sisters. And our first episode is going to cover the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics from Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman, the first seven issues. Our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series is gearing up to be a massive episode series. There are going to be bonus episodes. We're going to have an episode with our buddy Brian Young, the turtle He doesn't dork. even know. We he haven't even told him. We have not told him. But he's such him. a nice guy, he will totally come he on totally this podcast. Will. We will discuss with him his favorite movie, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from 1990. We're going to do a deep dive on that film I'm so excited to revisit that flick. I love that movie so much. And I don't we're not going to reveal this yet, but we might have some creator like a, a twist on the creator corner with mm. somebody in particular talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I also haven't reached out to them yet, but I'm pretty confident that they'll want to come on to talk TMNT. Oh my goodness. So, All of this D23 acceptance has gone right to your head. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you think you're unstoppable. I, I just think, I, I don't know. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is like, it, it's, it's one of the comics of my youth. Mm -hmm. It's one of the key bits of pop culture that made me who I am. And I could see us finishing out the year talking about nothing but Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It is September. <laughs> that blows my yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah, Time flies, Lisa. We've done 150 episodes. This episode right here is 151. That's right. I hope everyone listening checked out our conversation with Brian Michael Bendis and Andre Lima Arujo about their book, Phenomena, The Golden City of Eyes. That comic is also out now from Abrams Comic Arts. You need to put your fingers on that little beautiful gem. Can we wrap up this episode, Brad? Because we have only 45 weeks, one day, seven hours, 47 minutes, and 41 seconds until the next San Diego Comic-Con 2023. And I have a lot of preparations to do. Let's get out of here. It's an emergency. Where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show poster, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X. X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to get exclusive, Ooh. you can join our Patreon where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at 
CBCC Podcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. What? <laughs> Uh, you, <laughs> you nearly sneezing <laughs> has got me needing to sneeze. <laughs> well, stare at the sun. The sun, we, there's no windows in this room. Oh my God.